All right, so we're gonna start with um, chapter five. So chapter five is our exponents and our polynomials. So biggest thing is make sure we understand about exponents and about um, polynomials. So here we have negative eight to the fifth power. It's important to make sure we understand that the base here is eight and the exponent is just the five. So remember exponents can only apply to what's directly next to it. So because there's no parentheses, the base here is only the positive eight, not the negative. It With parentheses, it is, okay? So in your calculator, you would just put negative five carat, mm -hmm. negative eight carat five, and the calculator will give you that ridiculous number, negative 32,768. <clears throat> if you have parentheses present, it's important for you to recognize that, and let's not do to the fifth power, let's do to the second power, so that we understand that we are raising an actual negative eight to the second power. So you're multiplying it to itself twice, which is why it becomes out positive. Here, you're just multiplying eight to itself five times, and then the negative applies to the outcome. All right. And then here, obviously, is a base of nine and exponent of two, which would give us 81. So just make sure you understand how to identify a base and an exponent. All right. Any issues there? All right. So then we get into the important part, which is being able to deal with exponents as when they're with variable components. So we have to apply the rules that we're getting. So it's important to understand, remember the rules are really shortcuts because you always can just expand and count up how many variables are present. But the rule here says, always follow your order of operations. And order of operations never goes away, whether there's variables or just numbers, right? So parentheses exponents is what we would do first. So x to the fourth power being raised to the seventh power. So the rule says that you would just multiply those exponents together to get eight x to the 28th power, x over x12. So we need to make sure we understand the operation between these two x's here is a multiplication. It's the only operation where you don't have to see a symbol. So it is understood. So when we do x28 times x, we have to now recall our product rule, which is we are multiplying like bases because I have x's, both I have x's here. So we keep that X and we raise it to the 28 plus one. So remember the exponents are added. So we get X to the 29th over X to the 12th. So now you have to always remember, you must keep simplifying just like with fractions, right? Everything must always be lowest term. So we have X 29 over X 12. The rule says, well, you would need to subtract the exponents because essentially this is a dividing and division is just a shortcut of a subtract. So dividing X29 by X12, the rule says, well, you can just do X29 minus 12, keep the base, subtract the exponents. So you do 29 minus 12, you get a base, you get 17. So X to the 17th power. And that would be it, right? And so we also understand question. Any questions? No, no question. Okay, so then we also just want to make sure that we understand that it is possible that if we were to have x2 to the third power, that would give us x6 over x12. So here, x6 over x12, when you do your subtraction, you get x to the negative six. Remember, there is no such thing as a negative exponent, right? The definition of an exponent is to multiply the base to itself that number of times. What does it mean to multiply an x to itself negative six? It doesn't mean anything because a negative exponent is an actual, an actual thing. It only occurs because they have introduced a shortcut for us so that we don't have to actually write out a bunch of x's and cancel. So by introducing the shortcut, you introduce something that isn't really a thing. There is no such thing as a negative exponent. Multiplying x to itself negative six times doesn't mean anything to us. So the rule says, well, when you have a negative exponent, you must relocate it as a reciprocal. So what this is, is we need to make sure that we always remember that we would have to rewrite it as one over x to the sixth power, because that's really what it is. And if you look at what you have, you have x to the six over x 12. Well, you got more x's in the denominator, which means by the time you finish this problem, there should be x's left at the bottom. 
And so the problem will work itself out and show you what needs to happen. Because when you look at this original problem here, oh, I got 12 X's at the bottom and only six at the top, which means by the time I cancel, I'm gonna have six left at the bottom. All right, so that's just to help you be able to identify and catch your own issues and mistakes. All right, questions there, exponent rules. All right, so then you have your being able to simplify like combine like terms. So combining like terms with polynomials. So you have the subtraction here. Make sure it's just like we did in chapter two. Make sure you understand how to get rid of the parentheses. So there's just invisible ones outside these parentheses. So you would just distribute here. And then we would distribute this negative one here. So it's a negative three X cubed plus a six X squared. Then you look to see if you have any like terms. We always wanna make sure we remember our definition. Like terms means the base and the exponent are the same. So I have an X cubed, I have an X cubed. So that's a four minus a three, so X cubed. Then I have six X squared plus six X squared. So that gives me plus 12 X squared. And then the negative 4x doesn't have anybody. So we leave it like it is. So what we have to make sure is that we realize we are just adding and subtracting. Exponent values don't change when we add and subtract. So now you have to be able to keep straight when the exponent changes and when the exponent stays the same. So when we add and subtract like terms, we only are changing the coefficient. The variable component stays what it is. Only when we are multiplying or dividing can we change the variable and the exponent. All right, questions on that one. Any questions on adding and subtracting? No, okay. So you should also make sure that you can multiply. So within multiplication also has the adding and subtracting. So X plus three times four X, minus two. So this is where we should learn about distributing or the FOIL method. So when we are multiplying, everything we know about multiplication is really a distribute. So everything in your first set of parentheses would distribute to everything in the second set. So first my X distributes. So X times four X. So now this is where you have to use your exponent rules. X times the next yields a four X squared. X times negative two is gonna give us a negative two X then my positive three is gonna to distribute to everything in the second set of parentheses. So three times four X is gonna give us a plus 12 X. Three times negative two is gonna give us a negative six. So then you look to see about combining like terms, which is just the adding and subtracting of the terms. So I have a four X squared, the negative two X plus the 12 can actually combine. So that would give us a plus 10 X minus a six. So being able to multiply, you also would need to be able to understand about combining like terms and adding and subtracting, okay? All right, any questions about that problem? No? All right. So if we have three A minus four to the second power, so 3a minus four to the second power, we wanna make sure we understand that we have to write this twice. What we can't do is we can't just distribute that two to each term. So a lot of people wanna do that. That's not, you can't use that rule here. You have to rewrite this twice, 3a minus four times 3a minus four. So why don't y'all try that? 3a minus four times 3a minus four just for a high second, just see if you can multiply that to make sure you're good. Let me give you a second. A plus 16. All right, so you gotta make sure you're multiplying. So when we distribute and you gotta make sure you distribute, that's, you can't just do the shortcut. So you gotta go 3A times 3A, which will be 9A squared. Then we gotta go 3A times the negative four. So that's gonna be a negative 12A. Now we have to distribute this negative four. So that's gonna be negative 12A plus 16. So remember you're multiplying, so be careful, right? So the three times the three yields the nine. 
So in the middle, remember these are two negatives, so they don't cancel each other out. They add and keep the negative. So we're looking at 9a squared minus 24a plus 16 is what we should have. All right, problems, questions. Um, I have a question. How did you get the 12 again? The 12a? So the 3a times negative 4. Because everything in the first set of parentheses has to multiply to the everything in the second set of parentheses. Okay. All right. All right. Anybody else? Problem, question, issue. All right. All right. And then just make sure that you can do what you are distributing a, a binomial. to a, a trinomial problem, right? So just, and the distribution never changes. Like the process of multiplying is the process of multiplying. So as long as you understand whatever is in the first set of parentheses will always distribute to every single term in the second set of parentheses. So X times three X squared. So three X cubed, X times four X plus 4x squared, x times negative 5, negative 5x. So now that the x has distributed to everybody, the negative 2 must distribute to everybody. So negative 6x squared, 2 times positive 4x, negative 8x, negative 2 times negative 5, plus 10. So you want to always make sure you just multiply everybody piece by piece, distribute, and then you look in and we're looking for like terms. So 3x cubed has no like term. A 4x squared and negative 6x squared are like terms. So 4 minus a 6 is a negative 2. Then I have a negative 5 and a negative 8. So we get negative 13x and then plus 10 and you would be finished your problem. So distributing, it doesn't matter what you have to distribute. Everything in the first set of parentheses would multiply to everything in the second set. All right? All right, questions about that. Multiplying polynomials, multiplying, okay? Uh, I have one question. Uh -huh. So like, would we ever see, maybe possibly on the test, but maybe outside of like later on in our math careers, Will we see a um uh to the raised to the second power at the end of the um trinomial? Is that possible? Oh yeah, it is. So you mean like with a two here? Yes. Yeah, you could. It's just oh, so what would happen is on a problem like that, you would have to distribute first three x squared plus four x minus five, and you would have to write that twice, okay. multiply that whole thing out and then distribute the other part in the front because order of operation says parentheses exponent then multiplication. I mean, you shouldn't really see that. That would be a ridiculous problem type that would only be used maybe in like a, a, a differential equations or something higher, but the process never changes. So what that means is you can they can make you multiply anything because the process is the process. So it would just mean that you would have to write that twice. Okay and then multiply all that out, which is a lot of work and a lot of paper, but it's doable, right? Once you know a process, you know the process. It just depends on how long it takes, right? It's like baking or cooking. You follow directions, then you follow directions. Depending on the recipe, sometimes it might take you longer to do it, but the process doesn't change. Okay, and so the uh, the uh so we would distribute the neck, the negative, well, x2, well, x negative two to all, all of, so you would multiply all of this first. Okay. And then whatever you get, then you would distribute what's left. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So you would multiply all that out and you're going to get a long answer. And then you're going to multiply every X, everything in that by X and then multiply everything in that by negative two. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. All right. All right. Any other questions on multiplying? All right. Then just make sure that you know how to divide. So, and really dividing is like what we've already done when they teach you the um, the exponent rules for the most part. So 
So when you have to divide like this, please just make sure what they're telling you is, okay, we're dividing every single one of these terms. Realize these are terms. How do you know that they're terms? Because terms are always separated by pluses and minuses. So that means that you're going to rewrite this problem to divide everybody separately by that negative 5x. So the biggest thing is, does a student understand that they need to rewrite and divide by negative 5x? Don't be afraid to write. Trying to do it in your head is absolutely not what should happen. You cannot get out of algebra doing it in your head. You got to be able to write it. So you want to make sure that you're showing your work to show how much you understand about every problem. Even if you're not sure what the answer is, show your process. Algebra is about the process. Does the student understand what to do at each step? Does the student understand that this is just dividing everybody separately by negative 5x? Yes, check. That's partial credit right there. Now, does the student understand how to simplify each individual fraction? So this is a divide. So remember, you already know how to divide numbers. The only new part here is dividing variable components. So don't forget what you know. 15 divided by negative 5 is just a negative 3. If you can't do anything, you should be able to do the numbers, right? Like, don't be afraid to just show what you do know. And then x5 over x. So the rule says we would subtract the exponent. So that gives us x to the fourth power. Next, I'm looking at a negative 20 divided by a negative 5. That's a plus because a negative divided by a negative is a positive. Watch your signs. They matter. x to the fourth over x is going to give us a 4x to the third power. Then we have positive 25 divided by negative 5. That's going to yield a negative 5 answer with an x that has nobody with him to simplify. So he must stay where he is. You cannot move people from the bottom to the top just because. Okay, so he has nobody to simplify with. He's just going to stay in the denominator where he originated and the problem is finished. So just make sure you understand in your division, everybody divides separately. And then you just take in each individual fraction to simplify. All right, questions on dividing. All right, anybody have any other issues from chapter five? Exponents and polynomials, any other questions from that chapter? Okay. All right, so then your chapter three was your uh, graphing chapter. So chapter three was our graphing chapter. So biggest thing we want to make sure we understand, we want to make sure that we know how to complete a table of values. We want to make sure that we know how to complete a table of values and also that we know how to graph. So if they give you values, you should understand how to take an equation and substitute in what they're giving you. Remember a T-table. They're giving me a zero for X. I just substitute that in and I'm solving for my Y. Be careful with this problem type. Why? Because students always forget the negative. You got to pay attention. He's not just a Y. He's a negative Y. You have to respect him and apply his sign to him because when you don't, it messes up your answer because now this Y is not Y. He has a coefficient of a negative one, which means I have to divide both sides by negative one. So what you've probably seen is you'll get things right on the homework, but you'll say, hey, my signs are wrong all the time because you are not paying attention and they matter, right? So zero, negative six. Remember from the T table, that's really just an ordered pair. So next, they're giving us one. One is in the Y column. So I substitute in one for the Y value. And then I'm going to solve for my X here. So it's a subtracting. So it's a negative one. So I add the one because the one is subtracting from X. So I get X equals seven. All right. And then I have negative two for X. So I substitute in negative two for X. And I have to solve for my y. So I add two to both sides. Remember, once you add him to himself, you must cross the equal sign. You cannot add him to the y. So make sure you pay attention to that. So negative y equals eight. Again, that negative changes everything about the problem. So you have to divide by negative one. So y equals negative eight. So once you have completed a table of ordered pairs, you can now graph your line. Remember that when you're graphing a line, you must do x comma y. So zero, negative six, my x is zero. So that means I stay here, I don't go left or right, and then I go down six for my y. 
I mark my point. Next, I have a point seven one. So my X is seven. So from zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then I go up one to account for the Y value. Now you don't need three values to graph it. So you, but you could. So this would be negative two. And then we would go down to negative eight and we would get our three points. But all you really need is two points to graph a line. All right, but just make sure you can complete a table of ordered pairs and plot points. All right, any questions on completing a table? Any questions on plotting a point? I have a question. Yes. So when it's negative, I mean, when it's zero, you go down, right? If it's like, if it's for the X, you go down. So if X is zero, you just stay where you are and then it depends on what the Y value is. So here, because this Y is negative, we do go down. But if that okay. Y was positive, we would go up. Okay, I was get, I had it confused. I was going, doing the horizontal line, so. Okay, yes, so the horizontal line would go through the actual point. So the thing about this is because it fits for this whole line, but if it was just Y, equals negative six that's a different kind of line and that is a horizontal line but for that one you would just mark where y is negative six and then you draw the horizontal line through that point because that is that line but this okay. line that we're graphing is this one here and these ordered pairs help tell us oh these little ordered pairs help us create this line but the y equals line is different so it's kind of you just got to try to keep straight what you're doing if that makes okay. sense yeah, thank you. Yes. All right. All right. So then the other part is they teach us about ordered pairs in the table, but then they teach us the intercepts. And intercepts are important, especially if you have to go to college algebra next, um, which is the Math 130 class. Intercepts are important because intercepts are everything in terms of graphing. And so it's important to make sure you understand the x-intercept. Like you need to know the verbiage, right? So when the directions say find the x, inter x and y intercepts and use them to graph the line, that means we expect you to know that you have to use zero for y to find x. And if it's a y intercept, you are supposed to know that that means that you are supposed to use zero for x and find y. Because an x intercept means that you are on the x axis. So if you're on the x axis, that means the y component must be zero. So if we have the equation, 3x minus 4y equals 12, and they tell us to find the intercepts to graph this, we must find the intercepts. That means you need to substitute in zero for y and solve for x and vice versa. So we would get 3x equals 12, x equals four. So the x intercept is four. You gotta make sure you know which is the x, which is the y. The one that has the value that's not zero, that's whose intercept it is. So then I'm looking for my y intercept. So I would do three times zero minus four y equals 12. So negative four y equals 12, divide both sides by negative four, y equals negative three. So we have our x and we have our y intercept. And then you would use those intercepts to graph that line. And we love graphing intercepts because we know that they're on an axis because one of the components is always zero for the intercept. So four, zero. So I go where X is four, Y is zero. So I don't go up or down. And then for my Y intercept, my X is zero. And then my Y is negative three. So I just go down to negative three and I can graph my line. So your intercepts is important to make sure you understand those directions. Those directions are important. In algebra, the, the directions are gonna tell you what to do, but you have to make sure you know that vocabulary. All right, questions about the intercepts? Any questions about intercepts? Sam. All right, so then we introduced to slope. We got introduced to the slope. So the slope has a formula. So if you are given two order pairs, you are supposed to be able to identify the slope of the line, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And so if, we, if they give us order pairs, we are supposed to be able to identify the slope. I always recommend that you label. Please understand every ordered pair is a X comma Y. 
every order pairs the x comma y the x must always come first and they so wonderful to us alphabetical order is what they did x comma y so x comma y right x comma y so whoever you label as the first order pair that's x1 y1 whoever you want to label as the second order pair that's x2 y2 so in my formula i'm doing negative six minus three over five minus negative four be careful there right realize the formula already has the minus and then the four the x1 happens to be negative four don't be afraid to write the double negative all right so then you go through and you simplify negative nine over nine gives us a slope of negative one and that would be your answer okay and then they teach you a rule about parallel and perpendicular lines. So remember that parallel lines have the same slope. So it would be a negative one. Perpendicular lines have opposite reciprocal. So that means the sign changes and the fraction flips. So in this case, it would just be one because one over one is one. So the sign would just change to positive. So parallel lines have same slope. Perpendicular lines have opposite reciprocal. So if we had a slope of one half, a line parallel to that line would have a slope of one half. A line perpendicular to that line would be negative two because it would be a negative two over one, which would be a negative two. All right, so just make sure you can find the slope from the slope formula. Remember, they're gonna give you the slope formula on the test. You don't have to memorize any formulas. You just need to know how to directly substitute the values in. They're meant to be very easy problems. Show all of your work. Do not try to do anything in your head. Show that you understand how to substitute and how to simplify, okay? All right, any questions on the slope formula? All right, so then beyond the slope formula, they taught us how to be able to identify the slope from the slope intercept form, so from an equation. So what if you don't have ordered pairs? What if they just give you an equation of a line? So you want to be able to identify the slope from the equation of the line. So in the equation of the line, the M represents the slope and the B represents a Y intercept. Again, it's stuff you're just supposed to understand and know, right? So you got to, they're going to give you the slope intercept form. They're going to give you all the formulas, but you got to know what it means. Because I mean, it's sitting on the paper, but do you know what it means, right? So given an equation, if we are given an equation, 2x minus 3y is equal to 6, and they want us to identify the slope and the y-intercept, well, what we do is we put it in slope-intercept form. And in your mind, for your mind to understand, your brain has to understand what you're saying. So when you say slope-intercept form, if you haven't taught your brain what that means, you're just going to be sitting at the problem like, I don't even know, and help me solve this is not on the midterm, right? So you're just like, I don't know what's happening. You have to teach your brain that slope-intercept form means solve for y. Because when you tell yourself that that means solve for y, you'll know what to do. Solve for y means y needs to be isolated. So now I got a plan. How do I isolate y? Well, the 2x would have to relocate. So 2x moves by me subtracting it. You got to pay attention here. Everything you already learned is going to be necessary here. I mean, you can't combine this 2x and this 6. They are not like terms. So you got to pay attention. Right. So I'm already almost in my MX plus B form, but my Y is not completely isolated. So I got another step. This three has to move because it's multiplying to the Y. I'm dividing. Make sure you divide everybody separately. So we get Y equals a negative divided by a negative yields a positive. Two over three does not divide or reduce. So you leave it as two over three. No decimals. No decimals no decimals, all right? And then six divided by negative three is a two. So my slope is two over three and my y-intercept is negative two. So now you have been able to identify the slope and the y-intercept, all right? Any questions on getting the slope-intercept form before I graph it? Any questions? All right, so when you graph it, They'll tell you, graph using the slope and the y-intercept. So the y-intercept is your point negative two. So you plot your negative two because it's a y-intercept, which remember means the x component is zero. And then remember the slope is a rise over a run. The slope is a rise over a run. So the slope gives you directions. 
So you're starting at negative two and the slope is gonna tell you how to get to another point on the line. Go two blocks down, three blocks to the left. That's exactly what the slope is telling us. So from negative two, we're gonna rise up two, one, two, and we're gonna run over one, two, three spots and mark a second point. And that creates another point on my line and I'm good to go, okay? So what happens in the chapter three is they evolve you from picking points to intercepts to just being able to graph from the intercept form of the equation, all right? So that's what you wanna just make sure you can do. So intercept form, make sure you can graph using the slope and the y-intercept. All right, any questions? So pretty much when I you- I'm sorry. When you when you're doing the rise and run, uh -huh. pretty much it's always going up and to the right. Well, so yeah. unless unless you have a negative slope, if you have yeah, a negative slope, slope, you go down and right. Okay. But always run right. I tell people always run right. Just always apply the negative to the rise part. So if there's a negative slope, you rise up. I mean, you rise up down and then you run right. Okay. Uh huh. Devante. Yeah, and so I was wondering. So we're starting with uh, with uh, we're starting at negative two, and then we're going up two and over three. Yes, because in this situation, it's important to understand that the slope is not a point. The slope it tells you direction, but the slope doesn't tell you where you're beginning. <laughs> so the the B tells you where you're beginning. So we have to start at negative two because that's the only point we know. Because B is a y intercept where a slope is i'm gonna tell you how to go from one point to another point on the line but that's not a point so yes because it's negative two that's where we begin and then we use a slope to rise and run okay all right anybody else so so do we count from the point or do we count from the that notch above the point do oh very good from the notch above so when you're starting at the point, when I start at, at negative two, I'm going to go one, two. So you start and then you move one and then you move two. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. I see. But this this another question. Do they ever have graphs where you um go up and left? How I want... How does that look? I'm gonna show you. I, I'm gonna, we're gonna do one. Okay. Let me show you what that is. I don't. I don't like those, but I'm gonna tell you what what will happen. So let's say we have y equals one half x plus three. On this problem, there's no work for us to do because it's already in the slope intercept form. So if they was to tell you graph the line using the slope and the y intercept, well, we would be happy with this problem because oh, I don't have to do any work. I just already know what my y and my slope are. So then you would just try to graph it. So on our graph for this problem, and this is what I mean when I say it, you could go up and left, but I always tell students, always apply the negative to the rise part, right? Because actually in a fraction form, the negative should only be applied to the numerator or to the fraction as a whole. So what you do is I would start at my three, because it's a negative, I would tell you to just go down one and then run over two places. However, if you were to do and start at three and go up one and run over two, you would still get over to the same point. So you could rise up and use the negative to run left, but I think that that's confusing. And so for me, it makes more sense to tell you the rise is negative. That means just move down and always run to the right right? Because, and it flows better, right? Run right. So I just always recommend, it's not about what the graph, the graph can work. It'll do it whatever it needs to do because the math is so beautiful and the points work out. So the negative, I just tell you, just apply that negative as a rise down and always run to the right. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. Yes. All right. Any other questions on graphing a slope and a y-intercept? All right. And what you got to do is you got to try to make sure that you keep it straight because this problem is not the same as find the X and Y intercepts. Right. So a lot of times students on this problem end up plugging in zeros. That's not right. 
If they tell you slope intercept form, you got to put it in that y equals mx plus b. You only use the zeros when they say find the x and y intercepts. All right. So a lot of it is really about the directions and understanding what they're asking you to do on the problem. So just keep that in mind. Um, and I think, all right, that's all of chapter three. Anybody have any other issues they need from chapter three? All right. <laughs> Oh, the only other thing I would tell oh, you is, is uh -huh. they gonna have the um? You think they're gonna have the um the point slope thing on there too? Um, they might. So the point slope. Remember, they're gonna give you the formula, right? So they'll always give you the formula on the problem. So the thing about the point slope is, again, the directions really knowing the information. So the point slope form. And it's so funny because it's the point slope formula and you only use it, what? If they give you a point and a slope. So if they give us a slope of two and a point of four, three, negative four, they'll tell us, give the equation of the line from the given point and slope. So that's how you know you need the point slope formula based on the information you are given. So they gave us a point and they gave us a slope. So we use the point slope formula in order to get what we need, which is the Y intercept form is what they gonna always tell us. So we do a direct substitution. Remember your ordered pair here is X1, Y1. In this form, X and Y stay X and Y. You are substituting in only for the X1, Y1 and the M. So y minus negative four equals two times x minus three. Show your direct substitution and then you simplify properly. So I need to solve for y because you, they're gonna say you get it in this form. I subtract y from both sides. I get y equals two x minus 10. And that's your point slope. But honestly, I don't know if they put that on the midterm, but even if they do, the, the formula will be there. There's no direct substitution and then simplify your problem and it's going to work out exactly the way you need it to. All right. Any other questions there? No, thank you. Okay. All right. And then our first wonderful chapter, chapter two, where we learned about solving for X, where everything comes from simplifying, solving, everything is based on that chapter two information, right? Everything comes from that chapter two. Uh, so we just want to make sure we can simplify. So make sure you understand about distributing, right? Make sure you understand. So make sure you also understand there's no equal sign here and the directions have to tell you simplify. Directions are important. They tell you what to do, but if you don't know what the words mean, it's not going to matter, but that's why you have to teach your brain. That's how you know when you learn it, when you can read the directions and know what to do. So simplify means there's nothing you can solve for here. Plus, you know you can't solve it. There's no equal sign. So simplify just means distribute and combine like terms. That's all it does. That's all it means. So when I'm looking at this problem, all I can do is combine seven minus eight. Nobody's going to do change operations. I'm not adding nobody. I'm not subtracting anybody across the equal sign. I just combine like terms. So negative one plus 12 X, that's it. So you want to make sure you're careful and realize there's no equal sign here. You can't put in your own equal sign and start trying to solve, right? So just be careful and understand and pay attention to the directions and the problem type. All right, so simplifying. And then from simplifying, you make sure that you can solve. So you know you have to solve because the directions will tell you to solve and there'll be an equation. An equal sign will be present. So negative 3x minus 9 equals 11. So if I'm solving, that means my goal is to isolate the x. So to do this, the first thing I would have to do is move this 9. So I would add the 9. So negative three X is equal to 20. So now I need to divide by this negative three because it's multiplying to the X. So the only way to separate it is to divide. So X equals negative 20 over three. So in your calculator, when you divide that, we don't like decimals. When you divide it and you see a decimal, you need to clear it. And then you can try to see if the fraction can reduce. It gives you a mixed number. So 20 over three is what you'd have to leave your answer as, right? So just make sure no decimals. You just want to solve and simplify. All right, questions about that one? 
I was uh, wondering, I was a side question. Um, I was wondering if I could, if you could give me permission to record this. I'm recording it. I can uh, email it to you afterwards. You can just, I'm going to tell you to leave your email address and I'll email it to you. Thank you. Yes. All right. So this next one here, you guys try this one by yourself. The three times two X minus one equals 12. Just to make sure you're good. So try that problem real quick. Oh, I don't know the answer. Let's see. All right, this is a good one because 15 over six is not considered simplified, all right? So when you do your 15 over six, when you do that, you have to know how to reduce it yourself. If you're not good with fractions, your calculator should be your best friend. The ABC button. So when you try to divide it and you get the decimal, you should clear it and do your ABC. 15 ABC six, it'll give you a mixed number, all right? You see it's two, one, two, three values present, two and one half. But if you hit second and ABC again, it'll turn it into the improper fraction. So what we want as the answer is five over two. We don't we don't usually like mixed numbers and we don't like decimals unless we're doing like, you know, application problems. So lowest terms always. The ABC button is what you need to use. And that'll reduce it for you. All right, how do we do? Any problems on that problem? Any issues? Anybody have a question on solving for X? All right. So then we did um, the word problems where you do the translations, just doing the direct translation. So if you have direct translation, so like if we have the difference of twice a number and six is equal to Three times a number uh -uh. three times the sum of a number and four. All right, so the difference of twice a number and six is equal to three times the sum of a number and four. So this is direct substitution here. The word difference means subtract right but you want to understand that the operational word goes with the word and so that you know what you're actually taking the difference of so we are taking the difference of twice a number make sure you understand twice means two times something so we're taking the difference of twice a number and six all right and that is equal to three times the sum so here's what we need to pay attention to. Three times what? The sum. That means you are taking three times an operational word. That's when you bring in parentheses. It doesn't say times three times a number. It says three times the sum. So you're taking three and multiplying it to some operation of addition. And so what are we actually taking the sum of? A number and four. All right, so you want to break down your words in your direct translation. You want to break down your words in your direct translation. So here we're doing twice a number. We're actually multiplying to the variable, whereas here we're doing three times the operational word. That's how you know when you need parentheses. All right, so then you would just need to solve this. So we would distribute. So we would get 2x minus 6 equals 3x plus 12. I like my variable on the left side. So negative X minus six equals 12. Negative X equals 18. Divide both sides by negative one. So X equals negative 18. So X equals negative 18. But remember, you can solve however you solve, right? As long as you keep your problem balanced, meaning whatever you do to one side, you do to the other. Okay. All right. Questions about that one? Any questions about that one? All right. So the direct translations and then inequalities. So solving um, inequalities was the last part. So of chapter two. So negative three X less than or equal to six. So remember, we're trying to solve here. 
So remember your directions will tell you to solve and you'll see an inequality symbol that'll help you know. So to get X by itself, the only thing that is different about solving inequalities is this process we're doing right here, dividing by a negative. Anytime you divide by a negative, the inequality symbol must change direction. So six divided by the negative three gives us a negative two. When you have an inequality, you must have a graph and you must have interval notation for your solution. So the graph is gonna show me visually the solution. It's saying that the X, meaning any value here that it make this true, the solution is any value that is greater than or equal to negative two. So the numbers are greater than negative two going to the right. So you would shade to the right. Because of the or equal to, we would use a bracket here. Our interval notation comes straight from the graph. So my interval notation is bracket negative two to infinity with a parenthesis. Remember, infinities always have parentheses no matter what, because you can't actually touch infinity. So the infinities always use a parenthesis. So because of the or equal to, we use a bracket on the negative two. All right, so solving inequalities. Are we okay with the solving the inequality? Problems, questions, issues. All right, and then the other part with the inequalities was when it's a compound. So solving a compound inequality. So here, we have a compound inequality, right? You have two symbols present. This will be considered an and inequality. So the goal here is to isolate the X. So to do that, you would need to move this four. So we would add four across each inequality symbol, add him to itself, cross every symbol to add him on each side. You gotta be careful. Make sure you cover both sides, draw a little lines so you know where your inequality symbols are. A lot of people only focus on one side, it's both sides. So I got 10 less than X, less than or equal to 16. Your X is isolated, so you're finished. So then your graph, 10, 16. Your solution is between 10 and 16. There's a parenthesis on the 10, there's a bracket on the 16, and you shade in between them. And our solution is just like from the, the graph. So parenthesis 10 to 16 with a bracket would be the solution. So any value of X that is true has to be a number that's greater than 10 or less than or equal to 16. And it would fit and make a true statement. So solving compound inequalities, make sure you can graph and make sure you know your interval notation. All right, any questions on the inequalities? Nothing. That's chapter two, chapter three, and chapter five. Does anybody need anything, any questions from anything that you have? Any problems? The, um, the, when you do the unions again, I, I was having problems with that one. Okay. And the, what you call it, the intercept? That's what, that's what it is, union and intercept? Uh, oh, and the intersection? Yeah, the intersection, I'm sorry. Yeah, so the intersection, those are just the variable. Yeah, they're not going to have that on the midterm, but I, we will do, I'll show you one with the, um, so like this one, X is less than negative three or X is greater than one. So I just gave you one that was already solved so we can just show it, negative three, one. So X is less than negative three. So that's just a parenthesis and the values are less than, so they go to the left. Or X is greater than one. So it's a parenthesis and they go that way. So the ors usually shade separate directions. So when you do your interval notation, it goes from the smallest value to the largest value. So from negative infinity to negative three, and then we need a union just to connect those one to infinity. So you just solve your individual for each individual problem for X, and then you just shade it. And from your graph comes your interval notation. It's just like two separate interval notations that you just connect using that union symbol. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, other questions? Yes, I have a question uh, with this one. Um, not this one, but uh -huh. I was confused with, so when you have X, when you have X in the middle, uh -huh. you have negative two and then you have like S, X is less than negative two. Well, negative two 
less than X, and then you have, and right besides that, you have, yeah, positive two or something like that. So how, how can you, I know you have to read from the middle, but when, how, like that is, that could be greater than, right? Greater so, than negative two, right? Right, so what's happening here is you read it from the variable perspective. And mm -hmm. one thing you wanna make sure you understand is that the way it's written is actually giving you the solution. Basically the way it's written is that the solution for this equation is between, for this inequality is between negative two and two. The X is literally the solution in the middle. So on the graph, the solution is literally all values between negative two to two. But if we read it the way you want to read it as separate, what it's saying is X is greater than negative two because you have to read it from the variable perspective. And so the mouth is open to the X. So that's saying X is greater than negative two. Well, that means it's like that. This oh, says okay. X is less than two. Well, that means it's like this. Oh. They come in together, which is exactly what the solution shows you. It shows you the X directly in the middle between negative two and two. And the math is so beautiful, it works out perfectly. But because it's so beautiful, everybody wants to doubt that it's that simple. But it really comes together for you perfectly when you solve for X. And so your solution is between negative two to two. That is the solution. It is saying that any value between negative two and two will make that a true statement. Does that make sense? Yes. I was just struggling with the fact that it's still less than, but if you read it from the X perspective, it's greater than. Correct. Because the negative two is less than X, but you don't care what negative two is because your job is to identify the solution for X. And so reading it as negative two less than X doesn't do anything for you understanding the solution because the solution is about what is the X. So that's why you reading it from negative two is less than X doesn't help you. But when you read it from the variable perspective, X is greater than negative two. Now your graph works out. You understand? Okay. Yes. Yes. All right. Other questions. I have one question. Yes. Will y'all? Would they have that wonderful <laughs> the word problem? Um, not like the one you just worked. You know the oh, other side. Oh, the where you gotta break it up. Yeah. Would they be having that on the, the test? I, that's my big let, let me look at the uh review and see. I didn't see it on there, but let me see. Um, all they have, all I see, no, all I see is just being able to um, translate like we just did. Okay, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. But, but those are still oh, not that talking about measurement of the string and all that stuff. Yeah, that was that one was easy when when um my teacher yes. explained to me <laughs> yes. it became easy to me. So don't be afraid yeah. of. It. Yeah, you just got my recommendation is to always graph it. And on those, it's just going to always be like, it's either split into two or into three. So let's say the, the string is 20 feet, right? The string is 20 feet. And then really the most important part is the translation part. So they're just going to say, well, the longest part is two more, right? Three times more than two times the small part. It's always one part going to be X and the other part is going to be whatever the translation is. And then you're going to have to just add those pieces together and equal it to the total. Like it just becomes very re repetitive and redundant. It's just a matter of just realizing like, don't overthink it. One part has to be X. The other part is going to be a direct translation in the problem. And then once you have your two pieces, you just add whatever your pieces are added to equal that total. And then you're just going to go through and solve your problem. This one's not going to come out right because it's going to be fractured. But I don't think they're going to put that on there because it's not on the review. But just remember, it's really all about the translation. Everything yeah, is about the direct translation. Just make sure you understand different sum times, right? Like twice. Like just make sure that you can convert your words into algebra. Okay, I think that was my biggest issue with getting the, the wording right. Like the sum, like you were just saying, the sun, the difference. Yes. And so I'm and actually I'm just getting that like two nights ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah, so you gotta I'm just finally practice that. that part. So yeah, they just have translations on there. So just like the one we did, just make sure that you can translate a direct statement from algebra into